All right. I'm uh, happy to be here. Uh, it's uh, exciting set of textbooks. So it's rather late in the day. I've been assigned a graveyard session. My job is to wake you up. But who's already awake? Okay. It's encouraging. I um, will be talking about several things. One is um, what I've called operational agility, which is kind of agile and most of the talk will be about here today. I'll be also talking about what I've called strategic agility. Um, I'll be trying to show you why this is actually pretty important, if not crucial, vital. And I'll be getting into how do you implement I'd like to begin with a warning that what you're about to hear is going to be different. This is not the way people say organizations are run. It's not what you were taught in business school. It's not uh, what some of the presentations have been about today. And it may be disturbing because it may challenge some of the beliefs, some of the deep beliefs in the Agile community. And if it's too much stress, take a deep breath. Uh, not the end of the world, but it will be different. The um, thing is, when I wrote my 2010 book, This Guy's Radical Management, I thought this agile stuff is really amazing because it resolves the conundrum that in general management I've been struggling with for the last century. How do you get continuous innovation with disciplined execution? This was the solution to this fundamental problem. And I thought to myself, this is amazing. Most people in general management don't know about it, but when they do know about it, it will take over the world. And by 2020, I surmise, by 2020, Agile would be dominating the world. And when I wrote that book, the big reaction of the Agile community was pretty enthusiastic. Yay, this is great. Uh, we like what we yeah, but when I presented this kind of stuff in the general management world, groups like the Drucker Forum or Harvard Business School, I got a very different kind of reaction. Uh, because this is really way overblown. Agile may work in software, uh, but who's really going to learn anything about management from the people in the basement with blue hair and uh, tattoos? These are not the people who would change. About management. These are the worst managed people in the whole organization. Are they going to teach you about management? No way. Uh, it may work in small firms, small projects, uh, but it doesn't scale. If you want to have a serious organization uh, in a big firm, it's always you know, top down command and control. I mean, several millennia have showed us that. So these IT, uh, IT and Exxon, they're always going to be run these big hierarchies. And uh, they will need big systems and processes that you don't seem to have in that decade. And uh, even uh, the CEO of IBM said serious firms don't have names like these. Groups. And uh, so I uh, rolled back into my corner and uh, said, we'll see. And uh, fast forward to 2018, and what do we see? Well, we actually see that Agile is eating the world. Agile is eating the world. The five largest firms on the planet are not the big, lumbering 20th century dinosaurs, industrial firms like the Exxon. They are now firms that are agile. Amazon, Apple, Facebook, Google, Microsoft, the five biggest firms by market capitalization in the whole wide world. So what was a possibility of mirage almost in 2010 has become reality. And why are these firms the largest on the planet? Well, they are continuously innovating with instant, frictionless, intimate value at scale for their customers. Instant, frictionless, intimate value at scale. And that generates trust. Trust generates treasure beyond the dream of perhaps these firms are richer than anything uh, fairy tale writers could have Generating trust through continuous innovation and the value. And uh, other news, uh, it was 
spread the latest uh, issue of Business Review, which is kind of the Vatican of management. Uh, it's the latest issue it has three leading articles on Agile, and a sign that Agile is now part of the mainstream of business in the world. And they have this statement that almost 80% global executives rate Agile performance as a high organizational priority firm want to be agile. And we also have reliable knowledge now on how to be agile. And if you don't like my book, that's okay, because there are lots of other books that explain how to do it. So to summarize, most firms want to be agile, we know how to be agile, and the biggest firms already are agile. So, I won my bet. We live in the age of Agile, two years ahead of schedule. And uh, at the same time, no, not all as well. So, uh, although we have made these huge strides, and huge progress, uh, not all as well. In that uh, uh, on the business review, it said some want to be Agile, 80% want to be Agile, but talking with one of the founders of the movement, Jeff Sullivan, uh, last week, his estimate is that less than 20% of the firms that say they are already agile, less than 20% of those are implementing even the basics of agile. So there's a lot of loose talk about what is actually going on. And there are a lot of false prophets, uh, things that people ought to know uh, better, uh, like this. That agile is about twice the work in half the time. Agile is about going faster. Those Propositions are fundamentally false. It is about not twice the work in half the time. It's twice the value uh, from half the work. A very, very different. It's not about going faster. It's about delivering value faster to customers. Very fundamentally different. And uh, a lot of you know promising agile initiatives closed down by management. Featured some of them in the Agile Alliance webinars. Uh, at General Electric has celebrated example just the last few months where they've been put a massive effort into the startup and all things have been closed down. Uh, that effort. And uh, <clears throat> we also see that the language of Agile is quite chaotic. Uh, you see things like this. Uh, when, when general managers see this image, uh, or encounter this language, they throw up their hands and say, look, when you people get serious, when you people have acted together, I will not say anything to add to this chaotic sort of terminology that has uh, reverberated around. And, uh, and what is going on in Agile? Is it dominating the planet, or is it something that is a sideshow? So, places to go, I start to find out. The learning consortium group of some that are uh, implementing Agile and interested in learning from each other uh, about what works and what doesn't work. Are they sheltered confidential environments so that they can share their flaws and no one's talking to the other people? Uh, everyone is laying their stuff on the floor so we could see what's going on, what's working, what isn't working. And so we learned a number of things, much of which I've Already included in the book, and uh, let me summarize some of the headlines. Uh, one is, I guess the biggest headline is that agile management does work in big corporations, huge implementations, thousands of workers, developers, uh, hundreds of teams. That does work. Uh, no, uh, it's not the S, it's not the R. It is actually happening in these large organizations. It's not that it is. They don't have flaws, it's not that there are problems, but this is constantly and noticeably and uh, incontrovertibly better than uh, bureaucratic top down added control. It does actually work. That's the most important thing. But there are other things that we learn. We learn that traditional managers are wandering around organizations with a, a picture of what management is like and sort of engraved in their brain. And summarize it in these three propositions. The purpose, the goal of the organization is to make money for the corporation, maximize shareholder value, uh, and 
main way of doing that is to be more efficient and to cut costs. And of course, the workers are not particularly interested in being more efficient. You have to pay close attention to make sure that they are in a cost. And managers are wandering around the organization with that picture in their mind. And as long as that picture is in their mind, it should be very difficult to add up the cost. So we found that we really needed to find a way to raise that mental model uh, and around the organization, put in place a new image of what it is managed, what is the very nature of management. And uh, we looked around and tried to find out, well, what is, what is Agile? We looked at the Agile Manifesto, and it's a wonderful document to change it, but it's not a good way to communicate the idea of Agile to so manage the most core values and core principles, and that's just way too much. Uh, these people are super bright, uh, but uh, people actually walk around with very simple rules of thumb in their brain, and 16 elements is simply too much. Uh, does not compute and people uh, need something simpler. And in my 2010 book, I had seven principles, and I found that was too much. 16 to 7, uh, couldn't really absorb, couldn't even remember 7 principles. Um, 40 flavors, yeah, that's that's way too many. Uh, and what we settled on uh, is that there is really a triad of things which are at the core of what these firms are doing in terms of that. It's a tri different triad. And the first is valuing customers. The lighting customers, that's the key central goal of everyone in the organization. Everyone has to have a clear line of sight as to how they are delivering value, more value to customers. And work can be scaled, can be done by small organizing teams, uh, working in short time and getting feedback from customers. And the whole organization works in a fluid network, there is a top down hierarchy, in a fluid network. Going up across uh, every direction. And uh, underlying that triad is a simple proposition. You saw the case of the buying big stones on the planet. The continuous customers generating that means trust in customers and trust in companies. Huge financial gain. So you are not going to do so it's, it's not just that we took up the idea as a nice triad. This is its purpose for becoming rich. This is the basis for becoming a successful organization to follow these two principles. And uh, in fact, I call them laws. They're so important. The law, the law of the customer, the law of the small team, the law of the network. And the most important is to the law of the customer. It's not a new idea. Peter Drucker uh, said this back in 1994. There is only one valid purpose for the firm. Only one valid purpose for the firm. Not two, not three, not one. One. And that is to create customer. And he must have thought this was important because he said it in 1954. He said it again at great length in 1973. He said it again. So he must have thought it was rather important. And this uh, is really uh, uh, has a greater force even today uh, because the customer, the power of the customer is so much more powerful today, more forceful today than it was back in 1973. The customer is in charge of the market. So this central principle is what drives everything uh, at our uh, management and drives these vital decisions in the world. And I call it a Copernican revolution. And it's similar to the Copernican revolution of astronomy. We used to think that the uh, sun revolved around the Earth and we took it out and that had not changed. And the Earth revolved around the sun. And that changed the way we understood 
together. Uh, one of the things that we did farm was for the universe. Our crowd on the periphery, we tried to help them if we could, but basically, internal processes and they should provide them. Today, with the customer, we have a marketplace with customers at the center of the universe. Some of them center up there on the periphery of other firms, and we can do that with the material center. This is a different way of understanding how the universe works. That's the first thing. The second principle is the law of small teams, and this is what most of the sections that I heard today are talking about how small teams uh, are done. And it's about not scaling up work, but actually descaling work so that small teams can handle the problem. Groups, groups of small teams can handle the problem when they are self organizing cross functional teams, uh, working in small cycles. Direct feedback to customers and a whole host of other uh, practices that are important to make things work. And there's lots of variations in particular contexts and situations. But the basic idea is that all work is not possible by small cross section function working in small cycles. So you don't try to scale up the organization to handle the specific problem. Instead, you Descale the problem so that it can be handled. But I'm not going to say very much about this because it's such a central focus of all the discussions on that. It is an essential piece of essential because also it can be accompanied by these other two. The third law is the law of the network. Organization functions as an interactive, fluid network. I used to think. I tend to think that if you could make all the uh, teams agile, you would tend to have an organization that uh, found out that that really wasn't the case, that you had to do something more to make the organization agile. You have to uh, have make it. Fluid, where I think it's become anyway. And part of it is um, like this. Traditional managers walking around and move on the left, until they get comfortable to stick on the right, and not to bring up the problems. And the picture on the left will be having some serious pressure, conflict, difficulties between two visions. <laughs> Good work. And this is a huge cultural shift. Um, I was it's, uh, part of the McKinsey uh, hackathon on Agile in 2016. I had rather good presentation on Agile, which kind of explained what this thing was right like. And at the end of the day, end of the presentation, the McKinsey partner who was chairing the session said, "Well." That's agile. I think I'd rather have a triple uh, root canal operation. Uh, <laughs> simply a visceral reaction to this. Just couldn't face up to living in an organization that functions like this. And that's the way uh, agile organizations that they're working well, and they operate. And it can take a long time. Um, the work I described as the Microsoft journey. Uh, 2008, we had Aaron York uh, experimenting with one team. He found that they weren't moving fast enough, so he started to experiment with Agile. In 2009, he uh, persuaded a couple of teams. In 2010, he persuaded the Visual Studio group, about 35 teams. In 2011, uh, Brian Harry decided that the whole developer division, 4,000. 2013, they actually implemented a reorganization plan to reflect. 2014, there was firm wide interest. 2015, they had a bank wide mandate. 2017, they're still working on the cultural change. So that's 10 years. And there's a whole 
this is not something we can get enough to do. This is the thing that is going to happen. I believe the systems and courage uh, as the comments of the but it's an essential. Say the essence of the kinds of these three the customer network. And then both will tell me, uh, well, is that really all you need? I mean, surely we need budgeting, but what about budgeting? Surely we need agile HR. Uh, the answer is that my answer is that if you have these three laws, then what to do about HR and budgeting becomes obvious. And that drives the change in HR and budgeting. Um, but if you start the other way around and say, what would it like to have an agile HR function? Uh, you will make some progress, but the risk of not connecting with the customer, not connecting with how the organization as a whole is going to is a suggestion that you start in with these three laws and work through the other functions of the organization to make this important. So that's operational agility. So, okay, what's the, this? Is this thing you're talking about strategic? Well, this definition is called an operational building, or as we, we describe it, that uh, is about making existing products and services better, faster, and cheaper for existing customers. Strategic ability is about market creating innovation, creating new products, different product lines, bringing new customers, many more customers than we currently have. Examples of that, multiple uh, examples. Uh, I mean, Thomas Edison uh, didn't try to make a chemical uh, better. The last one, was he actually invented a new way of getting the mind of the bomb. Strategic ability to make the operation better. Well, Henry Ford, who said to have said, uh, and we'd asked his customers what they wanted, they wanted a faster horse. He didn't have that, he provided other people a different kind of transportation which had a vastly larger market than faster horses. So the iPhone, obviously, uh, was not just a better mobile phone, it was a multi function device that could do almost anything. The device could do amazingly different and brought in huge new. Back in 2007, when I was introduced, I didn't even have, have a mobile phone. I didn't need one. Um, I can't survive without it. We brought in customers who didn't want to be brought in. Everyone. Um, and Amazon uh, is not simply making retail better, you know, it's doing that. It's also generating new businesses, uh, bringing in lots of new customers. Uh, Echo. Device and Alexa will answer any question you have, or the web cloud services that Amazon has in the case, and far more money than we have. Uh, it's generating new businesses just this week. It's done exploring banking, grocery, and whole food. Uh, it is a serial innovator uh, in terms of strategic remarkable. Netflix uh, is just big. Renting DVDs, and streaming DVDs, or the movies, and all the producer of movies, making movies, and bringing the businesses. And today in the US, it has a network and cable networks, with huge numbers of And uh, what's happening in these all these examples is that. Um, is it just making the existing products and services better for existing customers? They are looking at the potential that if you made changes so that new customers could be brought into the market, do it in a very different business model. Why is this important? Well, this is where money is going to 
dark secret uh, of the Agile movement, I hope this is that the assumption that is quite common uh, for the presentations here that if you do Agile well, you have teams that are making the product better and faster and cheaper, uh, you will in due course be rewarded by your firm, and then the firm will also prosper. They will make money. That assumption has not been proven a reliable assumption in the best time. In fact, uh, the reason, the reason for that being in a world of much greater, more intense competition, and a world, a world where the customer has greater power and is able to insist on improvements uh, in products and services at no cost. On getting the product improved product at lower cost. So you are busy spending money making the product better and faster. And there's a customer paying less for it. How are you going to make money? This being a disappointment. It's been talked about in the management literature as you are operating in a world of fierce competition. Bloody red oceans of uh, fierce competition. While you're in that red ocean, um, no one makes a great deal of money. Everyone is struggling to uh, make money. And, uh, the uh, age change comes from market creating relations where there is no or little competition. It's how these two firms that I mentioned, Apple and so on. They got into a position where there was little competition with what they were doing, and that they found themselves in a blue ocean market creating relations. And when they got into this blue ocean and they established a position, then they <laughs> continued to get operational ability and kept making it better and better and better. So it was difficult to write them down. It's not that they abandoned operational ability, they did that as well, uh, but they established a position where there was less lesson competition. They didn't go down. We saw that obviously in mobile phones. Uh, the nature of it is it's interesting to think about, but uh, back in 2007, uh, we had these firms uh, all busy making their existing mobile phones better as their blackberry. And, uh, and, uh, and along, uh, they were in essentially the bloody red ocean. None of them were making a great deal of money. Nobody was making more money than old stuff. None of them were making huge amounts of money. And along came Apple and said, "What if? What if we did something What if we did something drastic? What if we took away the keyboard, took away the buttons?" I still meet people. Blackberry, the Blackberry users say they took away my keyboard. Still, still haven't survived the loss of the keyboard. So it was quite a big decision to take away uh, the beloved feature of uh, these phones. And uh, in their place, a uh, large screen that connected and uh, apps. They mobilized the whole army of apps to help us provide. It was cool. Very something everybody had to have. So I made money with them. And uh, this leads on to present class, which is a month or so ago, where Apple was the most valuable firm on the planet, but now Amazon is the fifth firm on the second one, but it's certainly fast, fast, fast. More than any history before. And what does fertility, repeat fertility, why does it need specific attention? Well, the reason is that simply carrying on in a traditional sort of agile fashion is unlikely to lead to this breakthrough. Because these four reasons that 
teams uh, and firm, they obviously can focus on customers who are in the teams and telling them this needs fixing, that needs changing, that needs better, that needs better, that needs better. Uh, they tend to focus on existing customers, existing customers will never tell the firm what something different might be. So the focus tends to be uh, turned away from and in particular, they resist dropping features, dropping the BlackBerry keyboard. That is a very difficult uh, decision in the sense to say we're going to take away the feature that customers love the most. That, if you're in a firm and you're making that decision, uh, you to think about your career. It's, are you going to be the person that builds this whole lot? And taking away the most fun. Uh, you often find that if you're creating a strategic application, uh, uh, you are cannibalizing your existing product. The iPhone probably cannibalized the iPod. That was a difficult decision within Apple to, uh, to actually make that decision. And Steve Jobs resisted for a long time uh, the idea of putting a music player on the iPhone because it was cannibalizing. Market, he was eventually persuaded that the gains from having music on the iPhone would vastly outweigh the and not capitalize on the music. But that is a difficult decision to make. And uh, the uh, changes sometimes require very significant investment. So you're down and bound to the organization, but even the middle of the organization may be difficult. To mobilize the management commitment to something that may look risky, is difficult, right? Uh, they end careers in person. Uh, and those kind of decisions and bureaucracy sometimes uh, is, those are very difficult decisions. So, for all these reasons, you are unlikely to see strategic innovation <laughs> occur unless, in fact, you have some specific field issues. Not that it can't happen. And I talk about one notable example in the book uh, that did happen. And we learn from it and see why it happened. It normally happens. And this was the case of uh, Discover Weekly in Spotify. Anyone use Spotify? Anyone use Discover Weekly? Same group. Um, Right. Uh, it's a music streaming service um, which, uh, uh, it, back in 2015, had 60 million users. And the problem that Spotify had, all the music streaming services have, that the Amazon uh, era, uh, is uh, how do you find music? You've got 20 million songs. How on earth do you find the music that you really love? What they find is that most people spend most of their time searching rather than listening. So this was a basic problem that all these streaming services had. Uh, and they had put a lot of effort into trying to find a solution, trying to make the search easy so people would be able to find the music that they would love. Uh, and in fact, on Spotify, the top management had committed a hundred staff uh, to work on improving search so that people would find music. And there was one team, though, a group of four people who uh, had a different idea. And Spotify was an organization with organization was encouraged to run a hackathon. So we came up with the idea well, why don't we put a playlist? Why don't we develop a playlist? which would be based on the user's tastes, and it would draw on these 20 million songs, and we would have put that playlist into the user's uh, group of playlists uh, each week, and each week they would get top songs. And the top management heard this reaction was, well, it will never work. And, uh, but then, that's not the 
corporate and local organizations to be able to self for everybody and to provide and they are able to provide to the experiments. They do uh, experiments and here the group come together and form the group team for it and they actually put it together. They benefited from the fact that the Spotify had invested a great deal in machine learning and it also invested a huge amount in classifying these many deal songs. So it wasn't a huge deal. It was a huge deal to connect the users' tastes to these 20 million songs and right, algorithms that every week would generate a new set of songs that the user might like. And of course, it was a huge gamble as to whether this would actually work. But what they did was write it out in the staff of Spotify. There was no announcement that they, uh, without telling them, the users, Spotify users, uh, users of Spotify, had suddenly found in their, in their Spotify playlist a playlist called the Spanish. So, just this. Wow! Where did these songs come from? I found my my latest favorite song. They put this one up and started talking amongst themselves. So they were recording now. So they were able to persuade the management. Why don't we try this out on one of Spotify's users? And uh, we got the same reaction. And it was thrilled to be every user who got ready to phone. And so they tried it and rolled it out to the whole 60 million users and 21. Languages, 15 time zones, and the whole position is also not just a gadget, but it's a feature of the country. So the country for the family, the French, the German, or whatever, it is just. I, I want to go discover Wikipedia. I want to discover Wikipedia. They would be looking at it for me and they realize that. Something in the world and so on. So uh, it led to this massive expansion of the ecosystem. There are other things to do with both of them. Huge driver. They are going public over this month. Now that happened with the organization in large part because the organization development well, was agile. Was uh, goal on delivering value to customers. We were all obsessed with getting a better experience for the customer. We were working in small teams, and the organization was working for a network. It wasn't for any idea. It could come from anywhere. So it can happen uh, to get people's ability uh, from the team to the organization. But I've been looking around and trying to find them. Really, is their own good example that I mean. I know of more examples. In general, if you are going to do a different uh, approach to make it happen systematically. Uh, the, I've called an innovation playbook. This is not something I invented, it's something that was developed by Kurt Carlson, who was the um, CEO of. SRI uh, International, which is a, a Silicon Valley group in town for about 70 years. But when he took over in 1988, it was bankrupt. And he stopped from trying to rescue it from ending bankruptcy. He was CEO for 16 years. And he generated a whole slew of strategic innovation, business creating. The most famous of them is uh, oh, uh, Siri, the uh, system for the iPhone. Uh, this is something that they developed. And one of them is what Kurt did uh, describe it in some detail. When he took over, he had about a meeting right in proposition for the value. Propositions methodology to uh, 
five foot base belt on a ten day label. So it's simple enough to make to remember uh, what it is that they're looking for. So they're looking for the need of the customer. So looking for the the approach uh, that you are taking in this environment so that you're whatever you're providing to take and you have have the benefit that will be generated by the view of the future and the competition. Those having those four elements are the crucial pieces to understand what they lead to So the first step is to get clear on what is the unmet need, how large is it? So if you take the Spotify Discover Weekly, the need was all of the 60 million users were facing this problem of having difficulty finding their favorite song, finding new songs. And the need was large, the 60 million, we all had this need. So it was a very large need. Um, and the approach needed to find a unique approach. The unique approach was to generate the playlist. For each user, plus one, because uh, plus one each user specifically crafted their background and their, uh, their taste in music based on the previous use of the line. Based on their reaction to the song, the third one, so find you start getting sort of a list and you you listen to some five times of songs and not others, then you get more or more of the song and the song you don't want to know that it's working. It's a unique approach to solving the problem. And the benefits, part of the benefits to the customer, the use of the producer, in the case of Spotify, uh, it was hugely increased in the enthusiasm, enthusiasm about Spotify. I actually started to learn, started to use Spotify when my daughter started to tell me about is this amazing all this ability. What was that? Actually, I was dragooned into some of the Spotify. Uh, so it generated this enthusiasm that led them. It didn't. They didn't weren't paid for doing it, but it led to this huge. And for the customers, they are thrilled. They're thrilled by each week they get a whole set of new songs that they can try out. Not almost every week. So, wow. Thanks. So, it has huge benefits for the producer and the competition. You uh, have to see what is competition for this idea. The main competition for most new ideas is not the main competition is that customers will be not uh, able to put up with this current mediocre existence uh, because the government customer can make that and solve the problem. Um, here, that because the customer didn't need to do anything. You know, to the playlist of it opened up. It's uh, Spotify and there it was. So it was frictionless, intimate, frictionless. So, uh, and as it happened, Spotify had already uh, got all of its data on its 60 million users, so it knew exactly what their faces were, and it had spent a huge amount of effort in classifying the 22 songs, so it would be able to mesh 60 million people with. Songs and each week generate playlists for So, other firms, Dora, Apple, Amazon, didn't have that, so it was something where there was several steps of the competition. So, they didn't use a form of playbook in that particular case, but you can see in retrospect uh, that is how you're able to see is this something that can be. What you see in SRI is that 
uh, they wouldn't invest very much in the food idea unless and until they had their NABC competition craft what benefits both competition was. Uh, in the case of Siri, they uh, spent three years discussing the value of competition before they, in, in retrospect, it seems obvious. Operational ability, this is not a bad thing, it's a central thing, it's good, it's surviving. Uh, but if you really want to try, you want to make it even faster, you need to be even bigger. So, it's summarized in the book, the laws of agile, how you create a cluster, supporting that, each of the ability, and the headwinds have a important role in that role, but the headwinds are not very real. It's uh, like we live in the age of agile, two years ahead of schedule. Uh, I think it is that we have one. Uh, there's still quite a lot of dinosaurs out there, and uh, they will not survive as they do today. But in the meantime, they can cause a lot of trouble to us who are living. Thanks very much. You have a good day. Thanks. Questions? Yeah, hi Steve. Uh, Google, Facebook, uh, you, know, you mentioned few companies, Amazon, they all talk it doesn't much talk about Scrum or, you know, much of the framework process. So, how, with respect to their teams, you know, in terms of operational and strategic agility, how the team grows? Well, um, I agree that uh, of those five 